AJ Johnson is the next Milwaukee Buck. Why? That is the question left in the hearts, minds, and throats of every Milwaukee Bucks fan and several members of the media. After last night's NBA draft, we're going to break it down here. Good afternoon, and thank you for enjoying it with a six-pack. The Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbrus. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. I suppose the updates of when, when we're going to drop the show, of course. You know, we're coming in a little bit later in the week, had a in travel travel week. You'll see I'm in uh, yet, a, yet another uh, undisclosed location. And... That undisclosed location is where I watched the NBA draft last night. Um, coming up very soon, we're going to have the second round in the first two-day NBA draft because for some reason we need to stretch that out as a television event. And with the Milwaukee Bucks first-round pick last night, the Milwaukee Bucks front office led by general manager John Horst Selected A.J. Johnson, a native of the United States who now comes back after spending a season in the Australian National Basketball League, the NBL. And we we have seen this play before. We, we have seen this play before with players who are very young, go over to the NBL, put together impressive seasons as a very young professional. And that's what AJ Johnson is going to be. An incredibly young professional, one of the youngest players in this NBA draft class. Now that we have more and more players sticking in college for multiple years, NBA draft classes are a little bit older. And at 19 years old and some change. AJ Johnson is one of the youngest in the class for a Milwaukee Bucks team that desperately needs to contend. Now the Milwaukee Bucks went young, went raw. Why? Why? I'm not going to stray from what feels to be the consensus here. I do not understand this pick. I have a, a theory on why the Milwaukee Bucks went a direction like AJ Johnson. I have I have one theory. Um, it's not a theory that makes me feel much, if at all, better about the Milwaukee Bucks moving forward in the next few seasons. But let's let's talk about AJ Johnson as an individual player. A little bit his background and i i struggle with wanting to do this because it's going to come off as a lot of criticism and the reason it's going to come off as criticism because he is young talented posted some of the best raw athletic numbers at the nba combine he has that he has that in his game he loves to go up and, and dunk at any opportunity. He's a fun young player to watch in certain circumstances. The reason this pick is being so widely criticized is not necessarily because of the caliber of prospect that A.J. Johnson is. It is about his fit with the Milwaukee Bucks in 2024. So let, let's talk about AJ Johnson a little bit now and, and his individual track record and, and some of his characteristics and break that down into why I do not think this pick makes a lot of sense for the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, Firstly, he was a high-level college basketball prospect. 
this is a guy who was a, a fringe five star kind of talent, uh, according to the two four seven sports composite rankings. He was a five star talent. Uh, 247 had his ranking at a 96 out of 100, just, just, just below that five star cutoff for him. So, it, kind of him, him going in in this range, in this pick, you know, late first rounder, that makes sense given AJ Johnson's you know overall pedigree as a recruit, as a prospect. But again, it's you know, a prospect, a, a projection. Something I don't think the Milwaukee Bucks can really afford to take a chance on right now. And we'll get into why again a little bit later in the show, but taken at face value of his pedigree as a recruit, his athleticism, this this makes sense. This is a spot late in the first round in his draft slotting that makes sense for, for AJ Johnson. He is six foot five, but has a six foot nine wingspan. You know, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, in the NBL, AJ Johnson averaged two point nine points per game, zero point seven assists per game, one point three rebounds per game, on thirty seven percent shooting. He did not log many minutes in an average of 7.7 minutes per game. Did not shoot free throws particularly well, 54%. Average 0.6 turnovers a game. It's like fine, given 7.7 minutes. The model for a young player coming over and, and contributing right away from the NBL is being, you know, a bona fide star at the professional level, or at least, you know, a, a young role player. And AJ Johnson wasn't that he's a guy who sat on the bench. His line in an interview with, uh, Kane Pittman of ESPN, a, a contributor, a, you know, an Australian himself, a, a contributor that Milwaukee Bucks fans know well. When Kane Pittman asked AJ Johnson last night, you know, what what does learning in the NBL do to help you transition to the NBA? AJ Johnson's response was, you know, it helps you get to understand the mental side of what it takes to go through the motions of being a professional. Was, was the crux of his answer. Had nothing to do with A.J. Johnson's play on the court because he barely saw the court. Not, not a player that had a lot of time to develop in the professional leagues. And given that he is incredibly raw as a prospect, that is a bit of a problem that he didn't get to take a large chunk of time to 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 develop on the court he was at one point in time committed to play basketball for the university of texas well i guess him leaving make makes sense given when he committed signed his nli and then choosing to forego that opportunity to play college basketball given the chris beard of it all being fired following a arrest for domestic violence allegations. Those charges, of course, later dropped, but the police report is pretty harrowing. Rodney Terry ultimately getting that interim position as an assistant and then promoted to the job full time. So I guess AJ Johnson was tied at the hip to I don't know a lot about AJ Johnson's college recruitment, um, but maybe you could see, you know, he he really planned on playing for Chris Beard. And when that went away, he decided to go elsewhere. But college basketball probably would have been a good spot for him to actually play more basketball. Because at six foot five, he is 160 pounds a year ago, 
listed, came into the combine, listed at 167 pounds, came into the draft combine at 167 pounds. Per um, at Bucks Breakdown, Bucks underscore Breakdown on Twitter. Great follow, by the way. AJ Johnson weighed 167 pounds at the combine. That would be the second slightest weight in the league last season. The only person lighter was Isaiah Joe, who's 165 pounds at six foot three. So shorter, weighs about the same. A lot of room for physical growth there, given uh, Bucks need somebody to play immediately. John Horst, Bucks general manager, asked after night one of the draft about AJ Johnson. He he said, you know, although he didn't play a lot last year in a really competitive NBL in Australia, he grew a lot. Physically, he grew a lot. This is just not true. This is just lying. <laughs> you would think as a full year, as a professional, and when you're not playing basketball, but you know, working on conditioning, hopefully working out, you're going to put on, and I understand putting on a lot of muscle is difficult, but if it's your full-time job to get stronger, to get better at playing basketball, putting on maybe seven pounds of muscle in a year. That's not great. And he was actually listed by the NBL at 165 pounds. So you don't know how much those extra two pounds at 167 that AJ Johnson weighed in at the combine, how much of that's real. I don't know. I don't know. Clearly the bucks were really high on him because Sam Vecini of the athletic, his last mock draft before, you know, the, the first round got underway, had AJ Johnson going to the Milwaukee Bucks. That that scuttlebutt happens to, you know, get, get into there. Happened to get hurt. It is something I am shocked by. And again, this isn't to say that AJ Johnson is not long for an NBA career. Being drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks, though, might be one of the worst things for him, given Doc Rivers never plays young guys. And Peter Bukowski of, you know, Locked On Packers of uh, The Leap, which is, he would say, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to, at Peter underscore Bukowski on the website, formerly known as Twitter. Had a take last night that was, I wonder if the Bucks were like, well, Doc isn't going to play him anyway, so we might as well pick someone who isn't ready now. Yeah. And when the Milwaukee Bucks are in win-now mode, win-now mode, you need to add a player who can contribute even at the fringes of your bench right away. This is clearly not it. This is young, athletic, high upside prospect that maybe you hit on. Maybe. But he can't contribute right away. When the Bucks lack front court depth, he's not going to contribute there. He's tiny. And when you have two pieces of your core, Damian Lillard, 33 years old, Chris Middleton, 32 years old, Brooke Lopez, whose age I forgot to look up part of this because I just know that he's ancient anyways, Brooke Lopez, 36 years old. This is a Milwaukee Bucks roster that is extremely old. And yeah, I get it. You say, okay, you all wanted the Bucks to get younger and more athletic, and here it is. But if it comes at the cost of a 22-year-old who actually can contribute to your team right away, that's not really what folks were looking for. Folks were looking for the Bucks to get slightly younger, but you need a piece who can realistically contribute on your roster and to be younger and help push the team forward. The only way I found to rationalize this pick is that the Milwaukee Bucks front office 
is terrified of the prospect of Giannis Antetokounmpo leaving. Because over the years, he has said, I want to you know, consistently compete, consistently contend. Giannis does not want to be part of a full-blown rebuild. So the Milwaukee Bucks aren't going to go all in now, I guess, which is odd because I don't know what other assets they have. You, if, if at the very worst, you were going to take on the, you weren't you. If the option was take on this project pick or trade back, you know, stock up some of your reserves because you don't have any tradable picks anymore. After you blew them all on Jay Crowder in February of 2023 for what five seconds, five second round picks. I mean, but again, yeah, like five seconds of Jay Crowder. Um, it was astonishing to see this team choose to bank on someone who might be good, might be good, three, four years from now, when Damian Lillard, Chris Middleton are out the door, I'm sure, retired or otherwise. But you need, potentially, to have another piece around Giannis that will help the Bucks contend way, 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 way later. You know, continue. So you have to take these high upside picks. You're afraid of having no resources at your disposal now. So you try to extend the window instead of understanding that your window is now. It doesn't make things better. It makes them understandable. It doesn't make things better because that means the front office is afraid of Giannis actually leaving, which is something that we in Milwaukee have basically said you know, this, is, this isn't realistic for a number of years and in the past hasn't been realistic. But perhaps now it is. And it doesn't make a lot of sense given that, you know, John Horst last night said, AJ Johnson has an opportunity. He does things that we need. So if he earns it, he'll play. And if he doesn't play, it's okay. Disagree. You are not a team that is rebuilding right now. You're not a team that can afford to have pieces that you have dedicated capital to. Real draft capital. That cannot contribute to a team right now. That is why A.J. Johnson was mocked in the second round, mid-second round, to late second round, to go to teams that have time to be patient with him. The Milwaukee Bucks are not a team that has the time to be patient with a prospect right now because your core is incredibly old. You have won one title with it, and your time is running out for a second. I, I want to get into a little bit of this being a concerning trend for the Milwaukee Bucks and, and not being able to capitalize on this draft and being able to capitalize on picks under Milwaukee Bucks general manager, John Horst. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about our friends over at TickPick because TickPick is where I get tickets to any live sporting event that I am headed to. Um, I've not been in town in Milwaukee for a number of days, um, but I'm going to get there soon. I'm going to be back home soon. And when I do, I'm going to go see the Milwaukee Brewers, who are up, what is it, <laughs> 15 games over 500 now, have a firm grasp on the NL Central. Freezing cold take by me, by the way, uh, that Milwaukee might not contend for uh, the division this year. But look, when I go to Milwaukee Brewers games, I get all my tickets on TickPick because TickPick gives me the best price on no fee tickets. You're never going to pay fees for tickets on TickPick. And when you use my link, Link that's on the screen now, link in the podcast description. You're going to save 10 bucks on your very first order on TickPick. So go to the Apple App Store, go to the Google Play Store, download the TickPick app. That's T I C K P I C K. Use my link and sign up to get 10 bucks off your first order on no fee tickets to see Milwaukee Bucks this fall, to see the Milwaukee Brewers this summer. Lots, lots of fun games at American Family Field this year. See concerts, see comedy shows. 
get the best price, never pay fees on tickets, save 10 bucks on your first order by using my link on Tick Pick. Uh, coming up this week on the show, the Wisconsin Badgers have their advanced scouting cap camp going on right now. I think we're going to see some, some offers fly out in the 2026 and maybe even 2027 high school recruiting classes today. I also want to dig into an interesting radio interview that Greg Gard did yesterday uh, and talk about the changes in recruiting philosophy under Greg Gard. Things that Wisconsin Badgers men's basketball team is doing to stay competitive in the new landscape given uh, that revenue sharing, paying players directly from the schools is coming to the NCAA. Um, Greg Gard had some illuminating things to say on the subject and how he is using his staff changes to really try and stay competitive in, in an evolving college basketball landscape with the transfer portal and pay for play where in, in his own words, you know, college basketball is very far ahead of the curve compared to other collegiate sports on that question. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about John Horst's abysmal record in the NBA draft. It is concerning. And we have reached, maybe after this season, a point of critical mass. If the Milwaukee Bucks can, if the Milwaukee Bucks have a healthy core in the playoffs, something that admittedly the Bucks have not had the last two seasons. But if the Bucks have a healthy core and cannot get to the conference final, at least, because this team is significantly lacking depth now. It, it, this roster is littered with players who will not play, will not contribute at a high level to this team. And a lot of that is because of draft decisions that have been made under John Horst. And this does go back further than John Horst. Uh, Milwaukee Bucks have not had great luck in the draft since the year 2001. The Milwaukee Bucks have drafted one all-star, and it is Giannis Antetokounmpo. Since John Horst became the GM in 2017, the Milwaukee Bucks have drafted Sindarius, Sindarius Thornwell in the second round, who is not in the league. DJ Wilson in the first round, who has bounced around between the G League and all over the league, but not a consistent NBA rotation piece anywhere. Dante DiVincenzo, an excellent draft pick in the first round of the 2018 draft by the Milwaukee Bucks, but did not bloom into what he is now until he left Milwaukee. Kevin Porter Jr. was drafted out of the first round, and he is out of the league. Been out of the league for a long time. Isaiah Todd drafted in the second round, and he's most recently signed with G League Ignite again. Marjan Bochamp, who I understand he has his fans. I, I am among them, but he has not gotten the kind of playing time to become a real role player on this team. And whether that is the fault of coaching, whether that is the fault of you picking him, it, it is it is hard hard to say. It's very, very, very hard to say. There's Jordan Moore in there who, you know, has become something of a fringe rotation player, but not for your own team. Yeah, Jordan Wara turned into um the five picks that you used to to trade for Jay Crowder. Uh what was it? Isaiah Todd was was drafted out and and became who you needed, who became um Was it R.J. Hampton? R.J. Hampton became, yeah, R.J. Hampton was the piece used to become uh, Drew Holiday. So you have that for you at you know, late first round, which was good. I, I mean, I guess that is probably the best use of a draft pick in the first round under general manager John Horst's tenure is using the draft rights to R.J. Hampton to get you Drew Holiday. 
who was a core piece that won you a title. Because Dante DiVincenzo could be part of that, except that he did not. He's doing it for the Nova Knicks now. <laughs> it is hard uh, to defend John Horst's track record as an NBA general manager. And I understand that the NBA draft is a lot more like trying to shoot a fish in a barrel. Get lucky. But at this point, the last five picks the Bucks have made in the draft, I guess over the last six picks, four of them have been non-college basketball picks. You have Marjan Bochamp out of G League Ignite, Isaiah Todd out of G League Ignite, RJ Hampton uh, out of the Australia Breakers, although not really the Bucks. Bucks draft pick, of course. Um, and now, AJ Johnson. It is concerning to, to see that this and I guess, you know, uh, Isaiah Todd is not really a uh, Bucks draft pick either. Um, but just knowing that the players that have come with these draft picks, you know, it, it's Mamu from Isaiah Todd. Okay. That's an interesting use of a very early second round pick. It is a piece that was better suited for a win now team for sure. But overall, the Bucks have not drafted a quality NBA player. I guess Jordan Noir might qualify for this, but Dante DiVincenzo is is the prime example of you know a high quality NBA player that the Bucks have drafted since John Horst took over, and John Horst shipped him out. And I get that she kind of had to do that, but it is it is rough, rough sledding out here for folks who might want to defend John Horst. I'm not really one of them right now, although he has navigated this team to a title, which is big. And God, this team, Damian Lillard, continues to navigate year after year to improve this team on the fringes in season with trades. But the draft has not been his forte. And from a philosophical standpoint, I do not understand this draft pick. I don't think it makes this team immediately better, which is what this draft pick needed to do, particularly with the rules now with the salary cap that are severely going to limit the Milwaukee Bucks, given that they are paying so high into the luxury tax now that it is going to make it more difficult for John Horst to piece together these trades because he cannot package together several players to match salaries and, and make the draft, make the matching salaries work for the Bucks moving forward. Has to be one to one. And when you are going to be hamstrung and not able to improve your team on the fringes in the manner that you have been able to in the past, you need to be able to capitalize in other ways to improve the team immediately. John Horst has not proven that the draft is something he is good. He, his front office, his team is good at using to help this Milwaukee Bucks team immediately improved. And he did not do that last night. So we shall see. Maybe they'll do that in the second round. I really doubt it. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. Stay tuned because we're going to come back and have some updates out of Wisconsin men's basketball advanced camp. Some offers coming out of there about players that I, I think you as... Badgers fans should keep an eye on um, and understand them with a new lens on how Greg Gard is building his roster and how Greg Gard has been impressed by um, 
some other folks on his roster. If you want to read more about what's going on in Badger fandom, uh, I have a new article up on Badger Nuts that you can find linked in the podcast description uh, about a Wisconsin Badger who recently was nominated for an ESPY award, uh, something that only two Badgers have been nominated for in the history of the ESPY awards. So check that out over on Badger Notes. And tune back in tomorrow here on the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. Thank you for listening and starting your day with a six pack. Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I've been your host, Kedrick Stumpers. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumpers, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. You can subscribe to us wherever you find podcasts Spotify, YouTube, Apple, at Scotty Six Pack. While you're there, leave a nice review, five stars, kind comments. Really does help the show. We'll talk to you all again very soon. Until then, Bucks and Six.